Thank you. Um, um, I was actually a replacement talk for somebody who couldn't come. So uh, I can see I know several people in the audience here uh, that probably have seen a previous version of this talk before. Anyway, so um, I'm Creston. As I said, as uh, Tom said, I'm CTO in Trifork, and I uh, I like to uh, to hack every once in a while. I go on a hacking spree uh, for a couple of weeks, and um, <clears throat> Four years ago, I found myself with some spare time. I uh, finished the project, and I wanted to go work on something else. And I, uh, I did the first version of, um, of this Erlang on the JVM. Uh, and there was a big, there was a lot of comments on, on Hacker News back then. Um, and this was actually, last time I did this talk, and just before Christmas, it was exactly four years ago. Um, so it isn't that long. Uh, since, uh, and, and lots of people were quite skeptic about whether this could even fly and whether this was a good, uh, whether this was a good thing to do, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and maybe uh, I'll come by some of these um, issues and questions um, as we go along that, that popped up back then. Um, but the, I'd say the most in intriguing thing, of course, was that some people said that this couldn't be done. And of course, that really triggered me to say, of course, you can do this. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't stop before it worked. Uh, the other thing is whether uh, this is something that's really desirable, uh, because generally people choose Erlang for reliability. And, um, and having Beam as a rock solid VM, even though it's pretty slow, um, might be more interesting than, than other options. So I was arguing back then that um, you know at least in Java space we have lots of applications where where um, throughput is more important than than actual latencies and stuff like that. Uh, so there's most likely a large class of applications uh, where people are accustomed to uh, to those prioritizations uh, rather than you know the latency kind of things that have typically been built with Erlang. Anyway, so just um, kind of the highlights of uh, of the features, Erjang is actually quite complete. It does actually run uh, a relatively recent release, um, also older releases. I'm working on um, 17 and maps and stuff, uh, but that doesn't work quite yet. It runs Java 7, so it, I've done quite a lot of refactoring recently to bring it up to a newer JVM. Uh, there's some stricter code generation requirements and stuff. Um, the basic operation of this is that it's a JIT. So it just in time compiles Beam code to JVM code. And for, from the Erlang program's point of view, uh, it really can't see a difference. Uh, it it's, works just like Beam, loading Beam files, and, uh, and it should, in principle, be completely transparent. Um, so on the upside, you could imagine you could do all kinds of interesting Java integration. You could run it inside a Java program. Um, you can um, imagine calling out to all kinds of interesting Java libraries uh, in a very efficient way, like Lucene was up today. So it uh, runs all kinds of Erlang things, Ets, Inet, uh, all async, IO, Nisia, compiler shell, Erlang distribution. You can run all that. Recently, we added um, support for NIFs. So you can just you take an existing Erlang release and just run Erlang on top of that. It'll load the NIFs right out of there. You don't need to recompile them or anything like that. And it, um, it's pretty complete. So back to the question why. And you have to keep this in mind. You know, this was really started as, um, as a project for me to learn Erlang. Um, so I, I've, I've done this before. I also did a Ruby VM and, uh, and an Objective-C compiler that Apple ended up using um, other things. So I, liked, I like this. Uh, I'm a language guy. I'm a compiler guy like many people here. And I, you know, it's just a good way to understand things is to build them. So um, it's kind of from a high-level point of view. Uh, when you run an Erlang program, it gets compiled into these Beam files just like Java code gets compiled into Java class files. And uh, 
they could run on a Beam emulator, and there's some built-in functions. Biffs, it took the nat that's the native code. You run all this on top of uh, whatever favorite OS you have. So what Urjang is is just a re-implementation of this middle layer in Java. Uh, and all the Biffs are then written in Java. And all this gets run on top of a DAVM. So the next level in the in the abstraction here is that everything gets run as Java bytecode. And that should really give you uh, all the advantages of the push that's constantly happening in JVM world. So as the JVM is really uh, a quite amazing piece of engineering effort that's been going on for the last uh, close to 20 years now, where it's constantly been pushing the compiler technology, the runtime compiler technology. And that was definitely one of the things I, I, was, I was disillusioned about when I came to, to Erlang world was, you know, why, do, why don't anyone have a, a dynamic optimizing compiler that does cross-module inlining and dynamic optimizations, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> that's one of the um, pros in being in the Java and JVM world. You know, it's socially acceptable. It provides integration to a, lots of stuff. There, anything you can connect to, you can connect to it in Java. But most interestingly, you have this constant push in, in the VM and in pushing performance. So from an Erlang perspective, there's also some kind of flip sides of the coin. Uh, <clears throat> here are some of them. You know, first of all, it's actually quite a challenge to implement it because, because Erlang is a dynamic language. The JVM is a static language, which is, uh, it's really very much tied to the Java language, the, the JVM bytecode. Um, and it has to, uh, has to pass this runtime uh, type check when you load code. There's all kinds of arbitrary limitations. For instance, functions are limited to 64K by code size. And actually, if you just take a standard Erlang distribution and compile all the Beam files that are in there, there's some of them that are bigger than 64K by code. Um, and there is some various peculiarities, like uh, it's not very easy to encode Erlang's process model, because in Erlang, in Erlang there's these very lightweight processes. Those don't can't come around in, in, in Java. Uh, there's threats. And then <clears throat> probably, uh, you know, it, it, well, probably quite critical thing that I that I often come across is the garbage collection is, is global. Uh, when I talk to people about it, they say, but what about garbage collection? And of course, um, garbage collection in Java is something that every once in a while more or less stops the world um, for like maybe a couple hundred milliseconds. So, you know, if you're into these low latency kinds of things, that, that's obviously the one uh, that's an issue. So, um, very well. Um, maybe, is it okay I run, um, oh, let, me, let me just try to run a little thing here, just to show you that it works, right? Put, uh, here we go. Right, so, So when I, um, I just say jurl here, that's Java Erlang. You run, you run the jurl command and you have a shell, just like any other shell. You can do one plus two and it, oh, there you go, computes three. Now this was pretty fast. You saw the, did you see the startup time? It was blessingly fast, right? Notice that. So let's try to, to stop this. Uh, and then I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do here is remove the, um, the my code, my, I'm gonna remove my code cache. Uh, let's try to start it up again. Now it starts somewhat slower because now it's actually JIT compiling to Java as we load here uh, the core modules of, um, of the Erlang distribution to get to this point. I compute one plus two. Uh, I can do one plus two 
much faster. Let's see if we have um, Oh, I didn't find the foo. Let's see. Ah. Here we go. CP. I don't have. A bit, it's a bit of a hassle here. Let me see. I can compile an Erlang file here. Now it's loading the Erlang compiler and compiling it to Java <laughs> bytecode. And then it took a while, but we can compile foo again. And now it's a lot faster. So basic stuff works, uh, but also more complex works. Complex stuff works. Anyway, let me get back to the, if I can find my slides here. Let's see if this works. Whee! OK. So if you want, I mean, Costas obviously has this very complex and nice big performance thing. I have a really modest performance, uh, uh, little performance thing I found somewhere in the OTP distribution, which has some, um, some basic numbers for comparing sequential Erlang, mostly, uh, between Beam and, um, and Erjang. And these are some kind of the coarse grain numbers for, for sequential Erlang uh, that, in general, is like quite a lot faster. It's like between 2 and 10 times faster for lots of things. Um, and you can look at these various numbers and explain what I can explain various things. For instance, you see. Working with some generic server with timeout is the slow one, where it's only about as fast as Beam. That's because my scheduler uh, sucks. I really didn't put much effort into to, uh, the scheduler. It's an interesting project that uh, could be done if somebody want to help out. Uh, there's probably lots of low-hanging fruit there. Um, another thing which we'll get back to why that is is float arithmetics, for instance, is a lot faster than Beam. And that's because um, Erjang can do type inference, uh, it does type inference on the Beam code, and can turn it into, essentially, in many cases, plain Java uh, floats that then get, turns into native code. So for this particular test program, it actually worked quite well. <coughs> um, Another little classic example is uh, the ring example. Uh, here's a 10,000 node ring, a 10,000 size ring, 10,000 processes. So you can actually run 10,000 processes quite easily. If I run it, there's some various graphs here for how many mm, nanoseconds per message. So a smaller one uh, is, big, is better. So Beam uh, with one scheduler is the big one. You can see, um, actually, the fastest Erjang version is, is actually one that only runs one scheduler. See, up here, Beam is faster with two, with two schedulers. This is run just on my, my own machine here. But Erjang is actually faster with just one scheduler. Um, again, that's back to the scheduler. Uh, you end up getting memory cache contention and all kinds of issues because it's just flushing forth them back, flushing memory forth them back. So if you see one of these runs, uh, here's, a, here's another one with 100,000 processes uh, running on Beam. Uh, it has various times, but the interesting are the numbers in the parentheses there you see uh, between seven and eight uh, microseconds per iteration in, in uh, Erjang, you see this number starting out quite big, but then falling. It starts out at it starts out at 12, and then falls down to like 2.8 microseconds per iteration. Um, so that's actually the JIT, the, the Java JIT kicking in, and optimizing the particular behaviors of this concrete Java program. Um, <clears throat> so that see that's the interesting. Uh, interesting thing about the JVM is that it, it actually constantly 
adapts to the particular behavior of the program as it's running right now. It might be that you're running batch jobs at night and other online things during the day, and actually dynamically over, over time, a JVM will, it caches the compiled code and, and manages the hotness, so if, if code hasn't been used much, you can throw out JIT compiled code and decide that something else needs to be compiled right now. So if we could bring that to uh, Erjang, that could be really interesting in terms of throughput and stuff. <clears throat> so um, the bulk of this talk will be on, uh, will be on um, kind of the internals of how the, how the, the virtual machine works. Um, so here's just some bullet points on, on things I'll go over. Are we loading beam files? Some on the float, flow analysis and type inference of the of Urchang, a little bit about code generation, uh, and then some things about uh, how, to enc how we're encoding tail calls, possible calls, and other very special cases. Um, so the JIT compiler hooks into, um, of course, you load a beam file. You first problem was to even read a beam file, because back when I was doing this four years ago, there really wasn't a spec for how to read a beam file. <laughs> you had to read the source, right? Uh, then I do various type analysis and stuff and uh, do JVM code gen. And that every module like that gets put into a file that just has the same name as the module and then a hash code over the module. So I can, that's how I cache them. I can, they, these jar files can then get reloaded. So it hooks in just like, the B, just like Beam does into the error handler. The error handler, aptly named, it should really be the unknown module handler uh, because it gets invoked whenever uh, some missing function is there. Uh, so there's an undefined function and then that calls the BIF called Erlang load module. And then, in our case, Erlang load module, well, it uses all the same uh, OTP logic for loading the modules from, from OTP paths, et cetera. And um, eventually, um, after, after then compiling that, it then uses the Java's class loader mechanism to, to load a, a Java class called erjang.m.foo, which is then living inside that jar file eventually. Um, so having each module in its own, in its own uh, class loader like this lets us do also c do code reloading. So code reloading also works. Um, you can't throw away code in, in Java, but you can make sure it gets garbage collected by removing all references to it. So some of the core co kind of difficult complex uh, encoding things is uh, is uh, how to encode processes and messaging, and that's actually I'm building this on top of a, a framework called Kilim, a code rewriting framework that rewrites the Java bytecode. So I generate Java bytecode and then pass it through a bytecode transformation system that then encodes um, a coroutine mechanism on top of that. Uh, tail calls I encode myself using this trampoline encoding, and the state encapsulation and immutability of data is just a nature of all the data structures being immutable. Uh, so it's all, all things like tuples and lists are of course just Java classes and instances of these Java classes. Uh, and they're just all persistent data structures. In fact, I use quite a bit of closures data structures for some of the things, uh, which are also just, just persistent data structures. So let's look at how a piece of code here gets uh, encoded. So here's a module that has two functions bat and foo, uh, and this has all the kind of recursiveness uh, features uh, listed. So we'll start by looking at the first function bat, which is the first, first clause is self-recursive, and the other clause uh, just returns one of the arguments. So when this gets compiled to beam code, uh, it looks some, something like this, this is like pseudo beam code. I cleaned it up a bit for presentation purposes. But essentially, uh, actually, OTP has this beam disassembler that you can just invoke to get printout 
somewhat like this. Um, so the um, so the the self call the self recursive call is that there's a special instruction for that called call last, which is essentially gets interpreted as a go to by uh, by the VM. Uh, there's a bunch of labels moving around X and Y registers, etc. Um, when this gets compiled into Java, actually, if you compile it into Java and then decompile that code with a Java bytecode decompiler, and pretty print it and clean it up a bit, then it looks like this. Um, <clears throat> I don't generate Java code, I generate JVM bytecode directly uh, because it's not all constructs that are like go to doesn't really exist in, uh, in Java. So this self-recursive function turns into something quite, sim quite simple and quite readable, um, where uh, it's essentially a loop where that continues really a Java bytecode go-to instruction. It's essentially a loop where all the type tests are done in this way uh, that I call some virtual function, and if it returns null, then the type test fails. And if it returns something else, then it that particular thing coming back is of the right type. So I see the first argument here is an E object, which is a generic supertype for all Erlang terms in my, in my world. And I can say test non-empty list, and if that really is a non-empty list, see before it's, there was this beam instruction, is non-empty list. So when I call test non-empty list, either it returns a non-empty list of, of the correct type, or it returns a null. So that's uh, how pattern matching uh, gets encoded quite straightforwardly. A list has to be decomposed in a head and a tail like this. Um, blah, blah, blah. Um, the second clause here, if it is test nil, then I get a, a nil value back. And if that is nil value is not null, then it is a nil, and then I can return it. Um, See, there's a, there's a special maybe block thing, uh, that one that's bold right there. That's because otherwise, so, the, so this is a place where uh, I'm encoding this as coroutines, but every time there's a backwards branch in the code generation, I always insert a, a check whether um, this process has been killed. Right? Did somebody say exit to this with some term? Because then this would cause the, an exception to happen at that point. Uh, the, uh, so this thing gets cleaned up correctly. Um, so these maybe blocks could be um, other things like inspection. If, it's, if a process is suspended, you can also ask it stack trace, and that gets created lazily also inside these things. Yeah, it's like an, yeah. I mean, it, it, all backwards branches, I insert this. So, but that, that means you eventually, this is like a safe point uh, or you know, a, a place where I can, so I, can sh I can be sure I can always get in contact with the process because it is cooperative, right? Um, um, maybe we'll have time to come back to that. Um, the other function down here is, uh, is two things that are different. One is that there's an external call, and also it's also tail recursive. Uh, the call to list reverse is in tail recursion position, and it's an external call. So let's look at how that gets encoded. Now, um, this foo function gets encoded into something like this, where see, I have the original foo function up there. Um, so the first thing is to uh, invoke the plus plus function in the Erlang module. That's plus plus is really uh, just a normal exported function as it's in the Erlang module. So we'll assume we have a static uh, global variable called Erlang append two that we can call invoke on. Okay, we'll come back to how that comes about. So that's just an invoke. Uh, so Erlang append two refers to a function object that we can invoke on. The next one is the tail recursive call to list reverse, which gets encoded because by, see, all, all functions have an extra argument, the eproc, which is uh, abstraction over the current process. So this is independent of thread. The current process is this lightweight process. 
and it has some special positions to store tail recursive calls. Uh, so what we store in, a, in these special variables, tail and arc, tail is the function that should be invoked in tail position, and arc is the argument to that. And then we return a special value and assume that whoever called me will make sure to make that invocation. Right? So every time you call a function that could be in tail position, you need to make a special, call it in a special way. And that particular special way is this. Um, actually, so when you do a normal call that's in line, that's not in tail position, you call the dollar call version here, which calls the tail version, that's the one you saw before. And if that returned a tail marker, then we have to iterate uh, on this function object and say, do one step of the tail recursion. Uh, and you just do this all over the place, and it falls out as, as tail recursion really working well. At the top level, there'll be one loop. At the very top level of, of, of a process, there'll be one loop that essentially boils down to all the tail recursion going on. So these magic global variables I talked about, they're actually injected uh, by using some Erlang, or some Java annotations. So this module that these functions get compiled into have static variables like this that have these Erjang specific import annotations. So when uh, uh, Erjang, J, the Erjang VM loads in this uh, particular class, it looks for these annotations and makes sure that we fill them out with an efun object that corresponds to whatever was declared here. So um, there was just a couple of recursion things. So there's a, there's a lot of different uh, types. Uh, so as I said, e object is kind of the generic top level term of everything. There's uh, numbers, integers, big, small, floating point numbers. Uh, so this is like a type hierarchy like this. Um, and this type hierarchy is one of the aspects that gets exploited by the JVM, because it can do its runtime type analysis and do more precise dispatches based on, on runtime type type and, and feedback information. So there's a, a hierarchy of different kinds of lists, const cells, ESECs are well-formed lists that we always know are well-formed. Uh, they're more efficient in various ways. Um, there's various of the basic types, atoms, references, PIDs, et cetera. A PID is not the same as a process. A PID is just a reference to a process. Yeah? You haven't told us about the scheduling. Well, <laughs> didn't I tell you it was broken? <laughs> okay. I'll tell you about that. So there's various types here. So there's some of the types, I'll, I'll get to, I'll, I'll jump to it. Some of the, these types are runtime type generated, like tuples, there's a, I generate a specific tuple class for each arity of tuples up to a point. And likewise for functions, uh, there's a, a function type generated kind of lazily for each arity of functions. So let's see, uh, I'll skip over this. Yeah, so there's, um, there's a flow analysis. Uh, so it does a complete abstract interpretation of the entire beam code, um, extracting as much type information as possible out of the, out of the abstract, uh, abstract co code interpretation. And that's actually combined with overloading of the built-in functions. For instance, here's some of the definitions of the, of the BIF called plus, right? So it says plus is actually overloaded depending on the, the types of the arguments. So the more precise the type inference can be, com can be combined with these overloaded versions of the BIFs. And actually, that's the combination is what makes the, the type analysis even more precise. So when you call something with a double, then you always know that the result is a double, for instance, if you plus two numbers like that. So there's some support for that. And that's, this whole thing is really the reason why this float arithmetic uh, ends up being so fast, because floats are one specific type, whereas numbers have two types, uh, integers have two types. There's the big and the small ones. 
So let's see, uh, encoding processes. That's what, is that what you want, or is it's really the scheduling that you want? OK. So Java doesn't really have lightweight threads, or some JVMs actually do have some pretty good lightweight threads. But in general, context, um, context switching is, is quite expensive. And it doesn't have coroutines either. So, so we really com completely rewrite the, the Java code to, to, turn, to, to enable coroutines. And I'll, I'll, I'll show how this works. So um, assume that you have a sequence of uh, activation records on the stack. These are Java, normal Java activation records that are on, uh, on the stack. And you, then you hit receive, some kind of blocking call. Receive is really more or less the only blocking call in, in Erlang, right? Yeah? Yeah? When you're in an infinite loop, yeah. Well, if you're in an infinite, well, as I said, the infinite loops always end up calling this. Um, they always end up. Or any any backwards branch always end up calling that maybe that, that uh, checkpoint that I said, and that one also checks the number of reductions. So you could. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Uh, That's there. Here. Right. There is a reduction counter, but it doesn't really count function calls. It calls like kind of uh, interesting, yeah. Um, so here I'll, I'll, I'll explain how the coroutines works. Okay, so you have a set of activation records like this. So so what's the time limit, by the way? Five. We're supposed to be finished five minutes too. Yeah. Okay. So you have a set of activation records here, ja plain Java activation records. Um, and they're not really easy to get rid of, right? <laughs> and say for each of these activation records, they represent some method, and there is some instruction pointer position inside that method where this given call was made. It's not always the same, of course. So, <clears throat> so if we hit a blocking call like this, a blocking operation, then um, essentially what the code rewriting does is it injects code for this case to save some logical program counter and the state of all the local variables. It's stored to the side in an object, in a Java object. So we create a Java object that has this information. This is where we are, and these, this is the value of all the local variables. We allocate a new thing on the heap to store this. Um, and then we return to the caller uh, in a special way. We make a normal return, of course, because that's the only thing you can do in Java land, but you set a global f uh, thread local f flag to say, we're, we're, right now we're suspending, so because just when I return from this function, you also need to save the PC in the state. And likewise, every time we go back, you save the PC in the state. And all this gets collected up in an array which is uh, which is really the suspended state of the current process, right? And then when um, we need to resume this function, or this, we need to resume this process, <coughs> you, uh, oh, I was actually one step behind in my slide. I was looking at my slide. When you need to resume this process, um, we can do that actually quite efficiently by creating an empty frame with uninitialized uh, Java uh, local variables. We only grab the program counter to figure out which nested call within that given method uh, that needs to get executed. So all the way up to the actual frame that needs to run again. Here we need to load the, also the state of the local variables. So now we have this uh, kind of very, shallow stack that has really no information in local variables. It just has activation records with, with default values in all, the no, in all the local variables and only meaningful local variables in the, in the top frame. 
So this is a typical pattern that happens, actually, that we then suspend again right away. Because often you're sitting in a loop receiving messages, right? Which is probably not uh, with an empty stack. You're running a gen server, and you have a couple of stack frames before you actually go in that loop that sits there receiving messages, right? So avoiding to uh, load, and load and save all the local variables of the kind of outer stack frames is, is actually quite a big win because you don't have to move this data around, you don't have to reallocate it. So if we suspend again at this point, <clears throat> we'll just save this current frame up there uh, and jump all the way out. We don't have to, we don't have to save anymore, right? Because all the, all the variables further down are the same as last time. So if we can keep track of this, if we're just careful in, the, in looking at the code and the way we rewrite the code and, and doing suspension, we can actually, we don't have to even have to save all the program counters and all the states because they're exactly as they were before. And this is, <coughs> this is the key to um, actually making these context switching be really fast is often there's just a single frame that you're sitting in a loop uh, receiving messages. So, so there, you run, end up running through a lot of instructions to do a context switch, but actually ver not much data is moving around to do a context switch. <clears throat> so if you do, instead of suspending here, you just return. Then, of course, as you, as you return, uh, you can load the local variables because we just keep enough infrastructure in place to know that when you return here, you actually don't have the local variables, so you need to, to uh, put them in place. So it kind of unrolls like this. So all this, of course, imposes a lot of extra taxes on the, on the code gen. So if you have a call to this, uh, if you have a foo function that calls far, as we saw before, it actually injects a lot of code surrounded. it. So running it. So whenever you enter one of these, you end up in a case statement, essentially, that switches on the current logical program counter, the call site counter, you could call it. Um, so it could be that uh, the, the logical program counter was one. That means we're actually inside this call site one. So we need to jump down there, do some housekeeping with the current stack frames. That's the down and up function call to do the housekeeping. Uh, and then we call bar with this special fiber abstraction, which is equivalent to the, this process, low, lightweight process. And then whenever you return, there's four, actually four different ways to return. Uh, they can, and that's the, every time you return from one of, uh, from a function call, uh, you actually have to, we, essentially this fip.up essentially checks this process local variable saying how are we returning? Are we returning because we're now suspending and this stack frame that we're in now should be saved? We should take the local variables and put them in uh, the reified stack representation. Are we now suspending in this fast way where we've previously been saved? Are we, if that's the case, then we just you know, return null because the, the values in the, in the stack representation are already there. Are we, we actually performing a return from the bar function and now we need to restore the local variables because we were previously suspended. Then we go into that restore local verse case. Otherwise we are in a return normal. So all this is of course extra instructions, but it's just instructions. Uh, it's just instructions and instructions are amazingly cheap uh, compared to moving data around. Um, and it's all, the data access that happens here is data access to hot memory, which is process lo uh, thread local. I mean, it's, it's all in a hot memory cache and probably level one cache anyway. So it actually amazingly doesn't cost a lot. It just kind of bloats the code. Um, so this, uh, in, in, in Java land, all these functions that can suspend, that can ultimately call uh, message receive, are actually marked by a 
by a checked exception called possible. So this can pause. Right? So that, that means it makes it kind of convenient uh, when writing Java code that <coughs> this possible ex exception, you're never supposed to catch it. Uh, but you, it kind of it's a marker that means anything that can throw this possible exception should have this transformation applied to it. Functions that are not possible don't have this all this bloat uh, applied to it. So leaf functions are 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 nice because they don't they don't need need to be bloated uh, this way. And then there is part of the flow analysis of uh, of a compile time is exactly to figure out to reduce the amount of this bloat also because uh, because uh, the, the flow analysis figures out if a given function could could be could be suspended uh, if it calls something that could be suspended so there's kind of an implication there so uh, quite recently so that's um, end of the code gen stuff um, quite recently I spent some time actually getting elixir running and it works quite well. Uh, so I really think Elixir is an interesting case for Erjang because uh, um, you know, in many ways it's a better Ruby, but in particular the Ruby community has quite good vibes from JRuby, uh, which is a Java Ruby implementation. Uh, and I, th I think because of that, uh, I, I, it could make both. It could make Elixir more interesting, maybe to some people, and this could be a way that also Erjang could get adoption uh, and get some interest once Elixir picks up. So I'm uh, hanging my hat on that, because of course uh, right now it's a it's a one man war. I actually have one of my employees who's also hacking it every once in a while. He can't stop. Um, so just like with so every time I pick up a new Erlang application and tries to run it on Erjang, I find some new corner cases that, I mean, that's the case. Every time I pick up a new application, there's new corner cases that, you know, doesn't work or whatever. Uh, I don't have a huge, extensive uh, test suite. Uh, that's another task if somebody wants to help me make the OTP tests work. Uh, for a long time, there was the bar for just even getting the OTP tests to run was so high that I didn't even try. But now I think uh, it, could, could probably uh, be made to work if somebody want to help with that. But for making Elixir run, <coughs> kind of the, the things I had to look at was fix the name mangling. Elixir generates some weird Erlang module names that have dots and weird things in them uh, that I didn't catch. Names of modules that, I mean, in principle, Erlang should support any atom as a module name. Uh, I, that didn't work. I had to work uh, quite a bit to reduce code and stack size. Uh, in particular, Erlang's compiler is pretty bad uh, for when running Erlang, the Erlang compiler on top of Elixir generated code, which probably also is quite big, kind of just those sheer levels of recursion was really pushing the, the limits. Uh, so in Erjang has a fixed stack size. Right, when you when you when you start uh, JVM, you say what stack size uh, you want uh, threads to have, and that's it. <coughs> of course, I made that big. Um, did various code generation rewrites to to reduce the stack size. And then Alexia's test suite is actually very very picky uh, with all kinds of error conditions, and make that uh, stack traces should be exactly the same. Uh, all kinds of boundary conditions. It's, it's, I was, I've really been impressed with Elixir's test suite. There's a ton of work being put into it. It's a super high quality um, test suite. So, uh, so it's, it actually can run quite a bit, uh, like 98% of Elixir's tests, of more than 2,000 unit tests. Um, <coughs> there's still some improvements in like areas like file systems and Unicode and files that have Unicode names and are corner case corner cases, these are like, but every application tends to have these corner cases that you run into. So the newest thing I'm hacking on now, this is the last slide. Uh, there's a new 
spell called Urjangify that you can cast on a release. <laughs> because uh, how, do you, how do you make people use this? Right, because you can run the JURL and then you get a shell running on top of an OTP release and blah, blah, blah. With uh, Urjangify spell, you can take an, some existing Erlang release, an application, and, and make it run Urjang. Uh, swizzling around startup scripts and arguments and stuff. Um, and I'm hacking R17 right now. And if somebody want to help out with any of these things or write a new scheduler, you're most welcome to uh, help me. So that was it. Ah, OK. Um, let me show you. Let's see. Have this. So, uh, so if I want to call a static function, uh, that's very easy. Um, so I just built into the error handler that if, if you call a module that doesn't exist and that happens to be a module that you can load, then I'll just load that Java class and call a function like that. So you can run the garbage collector, for instance, like this. Um, so that's very straightforward and very simple. Um, then if that thing happens to return a value, that's an interesting thing. <laughs> if it returns an integer, of course, it just gets an integer uh, or other primitive types. If it returns an object, then um, Things get tricky. Uh, if it returns an object, then it, it becomes a thing which is like a resource. Immediately, it looks like a resource, um, a NIF resource. So it prints as a binary. But you can match it as a number of different things. You can, you can match it as a list, for instance. And then I'll see, is it, does it implement Java util list? And then it magically kind of decomposes as a list. So this is, kind of, this is like how Clojure also does integration, where if you have an external Java object, then you can try to match it in different ways. And if it kind of implements a behavior that could reasonably be matched against a list, then it decomposes as a list, uh, or as a string, or as whatever. Uh, and you can also use that as, uh, as kind of the left-hand side here in front of a colon, you can, so you can do an what looks like a, an external function call on one of these things, kind of like uh, parameterized modules. Uh, so it looks uh, very much like pretty straightforward object-oriented programming. <clears throat> so that's that way. The other way, there's a, there's a Java API that you can use to send messages into Urgen. You can't call straight into Urgen code because it has this because it needs to run with its own uh, coroutine encoding stuff, but you can send messages into. So there's an RPC server. Whenever you run an Urjang VM, it also has a RPC server in there that you can use to call functions inside. Okay. Yeah, that's my question. Okay. <laughs>